I'm going to tell you about some of our recent work in using what um, now many of us call deep genomics models um, to understand gene regulation and make predictions about um, variant effects in personal genomes. So just um, briefly as motivation. Uh, so a fundamental goal in genomics is to understand how information about gene regulation is encoded in um, regulatory elements, um, or more specifically, cis regulatory elements, or CREs, with this idea that um, information about gene expression, which genes are expressed in a particular cellular context, is all encoded in regulatory regions that are active in a particular cell type. And if you could understand this language of um, gene regulation, so-called gene regulatory grammar, then we could kind of understand when a given gene would be expressed um, across like um, time and space. So toward this goal, there's been a large number of genomic assays that have been, have been invented in the last 10 or 20 years for identifying regulatory elements across uh, many different genomes and many different cell cellular contexts. Um, examples include ChIP-seq, ATAC-seq, DNA-seq, and so on. And as these technologies have matured, they've now been applied systematically across many different cell types, um, so to be able to identify where regulatory elements are. Um, so now with creation of very large databases or compendiums of regulatory elements, it's been very timely with um, recent advances in sequence-based deep learning models and the type of models that people refer to as sequence-to-function models, such that we can train very powerful and very large models that take as input genomic DNA. For example, this could be um, between 200 base pairs or hundreds of thousands of base pairs of genomic DNA from some non-coding region, and we can predict various types of functional information from these sequences that we measure in our assays. Um, so for example, the one common uh, type of models to train is to use as input genomic DNA, hundreds of base pairs long, to predict chromatin accessibility across different cellular contexts. And um, these models are becoming really, really popular in computational biology and, and genomics. And there are three reasons um, for, for this is that it's believed if we can really make accurate models that take as input DNA and predict function from it, um, then we can address three fundamental questions in biology. First, we can dissect these models to try to understand the sequence grammar of gene regulation. So what are the motifs and combinations that uh, make certain regions be accessible in particular cellular contexts? Second, we can use these models to predict effect of genetic variation because they just operate on genomic DNA. We can um, introduce arbitrary mutations and ask the model what happens to the function of that region if there was one or multiple mutations in a given region. Um, and third, we can use these models to um, design regulatory elements with specific properties. For example, design a sequence um, that's an enhancer in heart cells and nowhere else um, and things like that. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you about three um, projects from my lab around this topic of sequence to function models. So first part, I'll tell you about a little bit older work in um, building sequence to function models for predicting cell type specificity of chromatin um, state or cell type uh, chromatin um, chromatin state across different cell types from genomic DNA. Um, and the second part, I'm going to tell you about how we use these models to predict um, the effect of genetic variation across individuals. And the third, the shorter part, I'll tell you about how to improve um, these models to actually make better inferences from them. And all of these were done by previous and past students um, uh, in my lab. So um, we actually got started and got motivated to work in this direction based on a collaboration that we had a couple of years ago with the Imgen Consortium. And at that time, what Imgen did was create this very unique and um, large data source where um, they, they dissected the immune se system of adult mice to isolate 90 different immune cell types, which I'm showing you as this dendrogram. So um, hematopoietic stem cell are the top of the root of this um, Dendrogram, and on the bottom, there's like fully um, mature immune cell types. Um, and basically, for every immune um, cell type that they could isolate, they generated ATAC seq data. That's probably for each cell type, we can annotate it by uh, regions that have chromatin accessibility according to the ATAC seq assay. And I'm showing the from these peaks, which is like the height of the signal that we get um, with sequencing, which is proportional to kind of the strength of the chromatin accessibility at any given region. So altogether, this gave us uh, a data set of about 500,000 um, open chromatin regions, or we can call them CREs, 
um, each with a specific activity profile or chromatin state across the 90 different cell types that um, we had measurements for. Um, so using this data, um, kind of a, a very initially when we got into this um, line of work is we trained this model we call AI TAC, um, which takes as input genomic DNA. So it's actually pretty short genomic DNA, around 200 base pairs um, that are um, the length of the regions um, that you measure with um, ataxic assay. And it's a multitask model that predicts as output chromatin accessibility simultaneously across all the different cell types that were measured. And this was joint work with Christoph Benoit and Ricardo, um, who were um, the immunologists, collaborators, and my students, Sasha um, and Mark. Um, and so with this model, what we wanted to figure out is like, if we can, first of all, can we predict chromatin accessibility across cell types accurately using just genomic DNA? Is the information about chromatin accessibility mainly present in genomic DNA? Um, and second, how do we extract that information? And so um, one thing that I want to highlight is that, um, so there is, uh, when you have complex models and complex data set like this, there's many ways one can formulate the problem and train the models. Um, but exactly how you specify the loss function often ends up being very important and determines what the models learn. In this case, what we're really interested in is understanding the differences in um, kind of cis-regulatory grammar um, across the different cell types. And the way to get at this is to um, formulate a loss function that actually cares about prediction of differences in chromatin accessibility across um, the different cell types for a given input sequence. And we can do this with um, correlation loss um, for a given input sequence. So we measure the correlation between predicted and observed across the different cell type to emphasize that the care for the model to learn when there is differences in accessibility across the different cell types. Um, so the first question is like, how well a model can this uh, like this can perform? And we can measure that on left out test sequences. And to do this for any given region that was left out or any given sequence that was left out, um, we can use the correlation and predicted accessibility and observed accessibility across the different cell types to get one correlation value per region. Um, and we can visualize that this histogram here and compare it to a null, um, which was kind of really exciting to us when we first see this. Now it's four years ago, and I guess it's normal. Um, but at that time, like we didn't realize that there's so much signal for predicting chromatin accessibility from genomic um, DNA. And you can see compared to the null, um, there's a good number of um, sequences where we can actually predict the chromatin accessibility profile from, uh, from se sequence itself. Um, so, and I going back to the point that I made that depending on how you specify the loss function, the model learns different things. And so I want to illustrate that here with these two plots. Um, so on the left here is uh, kind of a heat map of predicted um, chromatin accessibility across the different cell types. So each row is I mean, one region in the genome and uh, on the columns, we have the chromatin accessibility of that region across the different cell types, which are grouped by the lineages that they belong to. And the thing that you can notice, so I'm showing you the top, you know, 10% well-predicted um, CREs. And what you can see here is that the regions that the model predicts well tends to be the regions that have high variance in chromatin accessibility across the different cell types, which is precisely what we want to understand. Like why does a given region, why is it accessible in T cells and not B cells? What sequence features make that determination? Um, but we can also compare a model with kind of a, that was trained on similar data or exactly the same data, but the main difference being the loss function that we use with a standard mean squared error that doesn't care about making accurate predictions across cell types. And if you look at the top predictions for that model, what we see is that I mean, you don't see as much variance. So the top predictions tend to be regions that are ubiquitously access accessible across the different cell types. And you can quantify that better by like um, kind of subsetting or stratifying the different regions but based on their variation in chromatin accessibility across cell types. And you see um, essentially the same results that depending on how you formulate your loss function, you learn different things from the same data. Um, another thing that made us really um, kind of excited about this is that, so this was trained on mouse data. So these are like sequences derived from um, the mouse genome and we're making predictions about chromatin accessibility in mouse cells. But at the same time, a data set came out where they'd done a similar experiment in human cells with measuring chromatin accessibility in a similar number of um, immune cell types from humans. And what we did to figure out if we really learn a generalizable kind of grammar of gene regulation 
we just used our model that was trained on mouse and applied it to the human data set. Um, and what we saw is like just, you know, zero shot learning, I guess that's what we can call it now is model trained on mouse can actually perform well, um, not as well as mouse, but uh, perform reasonable in the human, um, for the human data set. Um, and this kind of tell, told us that the model has learned some sort of generalizable grammar of gene regulation that we can go and um, dissect further. So and the next question we had was, what did the model learn and how does it make um, accurate and generalizable predictions? Um, and now I algorithms for trying to get at this question. Um, back a few years ago, we used the simplest method that you can use, which I'll call a node-based kind of ablation approach. And it essentially has three steps. Um, and it goes back to the fundamental of how do sequence-based models like this actually learn um, to make predictions. And the idea is that when you have a sequence-based model like this, um, it's a neural network model. So what it's doing is that it has um, a bunch of hidden nodes in the first layer that are convolutional filters. And what these convolutional filters are doing are each are learning a short sequence motif that I'm showing, I'm visualizing here that we can represent by a position weight matrix. Um, and then the model learns to combine these um, motifs that it's learned in the deeper layer to make a prediction about you know, the amount of chromatin accessibility for this given sequence. So the, there's three quantities that we care to extract from this model, um, just as a first um, kind of shot to, the, to figuring out what it, did it learned. The first is that we want to figure out what are these short sequence motifs that each of these nodes in the first layer have learned. So that's the information number one that we need. The second um, type of information that we need is to understand how important is each, each of these motifs for the model's prediction. And we can do this through ablation. So if you were to remove that node from the model, how much does it hurt the performance of the model? And the more important the motif is to the model, um, the, uh, the more it will hurt its performance when we ablate it. And the third quantity that can, we care about is the uncertainty. So when we have a um, non-complex model like this, depending on the initialization, we might learn slightly different set of parameters. Um, and um, it's not enough just to look at what features are learned in one model. We need a way to generalize across multiple models to get a more robust sense of what's happening. And so in step three, we use an ensembling approach to kind of quantify the robustness or reproducibility of each of the motifs that the model learned. Um, so very briefly, this was actually a very simple data set to do this exploration on to figure out you know, how to be robustly extract information from trained models like this. Um, and what we were able to show is that if you look at the first layer filters, um, we can extract these PWMs and then we can match them up with known transcription factor binding um, PWMs that um, we can get at from different databases, for example, SysBar, SysBP and JASPAR. Um, and if we um, kind of do that exercise systematically, what we see is that majority of these PWMs that the model has learned actually map onto known transcription factor um, binding sites or motifs that are known to be important in the immune system. So it was a really nice exercise to see that, you know, without telling the model anything about how chromatin accessibility is regulated, the model can actually rediscover um, motifs and their combinations that are predictive uh, of, of chromatin accessibility. We um, can also go one step further and look at, uh, because it's a multitask model, so for each motif that the model has learned, um, we can do this ablation exercise um, to quantify how important is each motif for each of the cell types um, that the model is making predictions on. So that result is just summarized by this heat map. Each row is a mo one motif that the model has learned, and each column is the importance of that motif, or what we call influence, to the different cell types um, that we're predicting. And we did, we did a bunch of, kind of validation of this um, heat map. Uh, for example, we could show that um, you know, the one transcription factor, PAX5, which is very important for B cells, and the model tends to believe that it's very important in B cells as well. If you look at the motif importance of PAX5 and compare it against its gene expression, which was not used during model training, we see very good correlation between those two things, which kind of makes sense. And it's kind of a um, kind of a validation that the model is learning biologically interesting stuff. So I wanted to give a, a brief summary of what we've done. Uh, this was older work to move on to some of the newer, um, um, newer projects we, we're doing with these sequence-based um, models. So in the second part, I'm going to tell you about how we use these models to 
um, interpret personal genomes and where do the models like this perform well and, and when do they fail? Okay, so, um, so I gave you an example of like one type of sequence based model. Um, it was from our own lab called AI TAC, but now there is many different models like this that have been trained on different kinds of data sets or for predicting different kinds of functional information. But all of these models essentially are using one key insight, which is that regions across the genome are used uh, are, are treated as training examples. Um, so, um, you know, if you have chromatin accessibility data, even for a single cell type, the number of regions that you have chromatin accessibility measurement for, usually in 100 kb, that becomes the number of training examples that you use to train your models. So even in a single experiment, you have lots of data to train models, and that's why they're performing really well. Um, um, and so, uh, so that's the key insight that many of the models are using. Um, and in particular, the way they're typically evaluated is that um, you leave out some regions that you didn't include as part of your training, for example, regions um, on some left out chromosomes, and you're making predictions for those left out regions. Um, so the models end up doing well in this task, uh, for example, either you can predict chromatin accessibility or newer models predict gene expression, um, where you leave out, um, let's say, certain regions or certain genes, and you look at predicted versus observed gene expression in that cellular context that your model was trained on. And when you look at this, essentially the models are trying to distinguish between regions that have high versus low expression across the genome or across the left out region. So low expressing versus high expressing genes on a given left out chromosome. Um, and and you know, they do this by learning uh, motifs or regulatory motifs that are important for predicting either chromatin accessibility or gene expression. So, um, so even though the models are trained and evaluated in this way, but one thing that we really care about, not just us, but like many, many in the field care about is I'm using these models for performing in silico mutagenesis analysis. So what is in silico mutagenesis analysis or ISM? The idea is that if you have a sequence-based model that can make accurate predictions, um, then you can introduce arbitrary mutations um, in, a, in an input sequence that the model has never seen before and ask the model to predict the impact of that arbitrary mutation. So say my, my model was trained on a reference genome where it's only seen you know, one version of this input sequence. Now I can introduce an arbitrary mutation from a T to a C and inject that model, uh, inject that sequence into the model and ask um, how different was the prediction when I had a T versus a C here. And if I do this systematically across an input sequence, I can basically get a base pair resolution mutation effect prediction for my entire sequence. So this has been a really kind of exciting possible use case of these models. And if you can do something like this, then we have an in silico version of um, saturation mutagenesis experiments um, that currently can only be done experimentally. Um, so even though none of the models that you know, people have developed so far have been trained on genetic variation data in this way, it's hoped that they can actually make this kind of prediction. Um, and there's some hope on that based on kind of evaluating these models using EQTL data. So let me explain a little bit what EQTL are and how people do this. Um, so currently the standard approach for actually predicting variant effect is to collect genotype data across a set of individuals and gene expression data across the set of across the same set of individuals. Then we can correlate diff the variation of um, genotypes at a particular um, location across the individuals with the variation in their gene expression. And this allows us to come up with a list, list of you know, genetic uh, variant that are associated with um, gene expression differences across individuals. Uh, but one um, kind of um, nuance um, issue that needs to be taken care of is that with this kind of statistical correlation approach, LD becomes an issue or linkage disequilibrium becomes an issue because there could be many variants in a given loci that are in LD with each other. And we don't necessarily know which one is the causal variant that is actually impacting gene expression. So to get around this problem, what uh, kind of, uh, previous studies that used EQTL to evaluate one of these sequence-based models, what they've done is use fine-mapped um, causal 
um, EQTLs, which are basically a subset of EQTLs that you can uh, predict to be more causal than the others with statistical fine mapping. Um, and I've shown that if you look at um, kind of um, predicted causal EQTLs um, and compare it to um, you know, random variation, um, sequence-based models um, can typically make prediction about you know, the causal ones are likely to have a larger impact on gene expression than the non-causal one. And this is a plot from uh, one of, not our paper, but a previous um, paper called um, Borzoi, which is a sequel to another very popular model called um, Informer. Uh, and so based on you know, evaluating these models with EQTL data set, there's been some hope that even though these models have never been trained on genetic variation data, they can possibly predict the effect of genetic variation. So in our recent work, what we wanted to do is get a better sense of how accurately can models actually do that. And we were not satisfied with kind of these genome-wide EQTL statistic analysis um, because they have their own issues um, and they're not as high resolution in a given region. So um, our core idea was that um, we can actually evaluate sequence-based models using um, cohort studies where we've where we've actually measured whole genome sequencing data paired with um, a functional data, for example, RNA-seq data for the same set of individuals. So if you have a data set that you can use to do EQTLs, you can actually directly use that data to evaluate models as opposed to going to the secondary EQTL um, analysis, which I'll explain in a second. Um, so our idea was that um, if you have whole genome sequencing data for a bunch of individuals, which we had from a cohort called ROSMAP study, what we can do is construct these personal genomic sequences for any given uh, region in the genome, where we insert each individual's variant in the reference genome to get these like personal um, region-based um, sequence profiles. And we can use those sequences as input to the model to predict various um, types of functional information. Um, so we actually did this with a model called Informer, uh, but I also want to highlight that we're not trying to single out Informer. This type of analysis we've done with other models and uh, kind of results generalize, but I'm going to tell you generalizes across many different sequence-based models like this. Um, and so the idea is that um, we can use these personal genome as input to the model that are already trained and make prediction about, uh, for example, gene expression for each of these individualized sequences. And then we can compare that to observed gene expression. So I'm going to first tell you about um, how models like this perform on a single region um, as an example, and then I'm going to generalize that to how they perform if we systematically ev evaluate models like this across the genome. Okay, so for the first region I'm going to talk about, it's basically um, a locus around a gene called DDX11, and this is a very easy example. So you can think of it as a positive control, um, as a positive control there, where we think um, you know it should be pretty easy for models to get this right. And the reason why this is pretty easy is because um, this gene, DDX11, the expression, dif the differential gene expression of DDX11 across individuals um, in the brain, which is where our data is coming from, is known to be highly heritable. Um, so her heritability is on the order of 80%. Um, and with statistical fine mapping, you can actually identify a single causal variant um, that explains the differential gene expression across individuals. So this is a plot from data from GTEx, but in many other brain data sets, you can see the same thing. So if you look at gene expression level across individuals stratified by genotype, you see a very clear relationship between genotype and gene expression. And this is all explained by a single kind of uh, causal variant. Um, so I guess this is an easy example because we have a single variant that's um, very predictive of gene expression, um, and the effect size is really high. So um, you can see how a model like Informer um, does in this case by creating these personal genomic sequences around um, this DDX11 locus to predict gene expression at that locus. And so we have a bunch of input sequences using um, kind of this cohort study that we had that has 800 individuals. And for each of these personalized um, genome sequences, we get a prediction for one person, which we can plot here. So we have predicted gene expression versus observed gene expression. And what we can see here is that there is a good correlation between predicted and observed. So the correlation uh, is on the order of 0.85 for this gene. But now what happens if we 
generalize um, the same analysis across um, all the expressed genes in the brain that we can um, uh, measure. Oh, sorry, before I get there. Um, so how did the model actually perform really well on this one gene? Um, it's actually because it's a mechanistic sequence-based model, and it's really beautiful to look at how it does this. Um, so I'm showing you with this figure, which I'll explain. So what, what we can do is, um, if you look at the genomic DNA across individuals for this one gene, there's thousands of variants because this is whole genome sequencing data. So we have rare and common variants. So there could be thousands of variants um, in this locus. But among those thousands of variants, if you perform ISM, so if you do in silico mutagenesis to see which ones are important for making the model's prediction, we'll see there's one variant that's very close to TSS that tends to have very large ISM value. So these dots represent the ISM value for all the variants. And you can see this one kind of stands out. Um, and if you look at the sequence attribution around that variant that stands out, what we see is that um, there, um, in the reference um, in the reference sequence, um, there is, I think in the reference sequence, there is a T that the variant has an A of. And what happens is that when you introdu introduce the A, um, gene expression increases. So it was by a repressive motif that you disrupt it. And that's why you see um, kind of a really nice correlation between observed and predicted. There is a mechanistic explanation of what's happening there. Um, now what happens if we repeat this analysis for all the expressed genes? So that's what I'm showing you here. So each dot now represents the correlation between predicted and observed and, um, and uh, across individual in a single gene. Um, and the on the Y, I'm showing you the performance of this uh, informer model, which we were benchmarking here. And on the X axis, what I'm showing you is the actual um, is performance from a very standard statistical genetics model that makes very different assumption, but it's basically a linear model um, that predicts gene expression from observed genotype data across individuals. And the reason why it's important to have it as the x-axis is because it presents a lower bound on gene expression heritability. So not all genes um, are um, differential, not all genes, um, not all variation in gene expression um, is heritable um, and, not, and some of it is not genetics. So um, by looking at PredictScan, we can have a sense of how much of gene expression variation across individuals we should be able to explain um, purely on based on genetic data. And there's two points um, to make um, on this plot. The first is that um, if you look at the correlation values that we get for Informer, they're both positive and negatives. Um, and what that tends to mean is that the generally Informer is not getting variant effect when it's making predictions. So sometimes I think gene expression should be increased where it's actually decreased and vice versa. Um, and the second important point is that um, when we compare it to uh, the cis heritability of gene expression, um, a sequence-based model like Informer is really underperforming. So, and I want to make sure to mention that um, what we've realized through um, kind of this analysis of our own and a co-submitted paper is that these results tend to be generalizable to um, other gene expression-based uh, models, so not just informer, as long as they use the same training recipe where they're only kind of trained on a single kind of reference genome in a region-wise uh, manner that I um, explained. And so we did a lot of work to figure out what, why this is the case and how come these models are failing to predict variation in gene expression across individuals. Um, and I guess high level conclusion that we came up with is that when they do learn a sequence grammar that they use for predicting gene expression, they tend, those sequence grammar tend to be very sparse um, and usually are very sparse in the regions that contain causal variants. Um, so here's, let me just tell you what this example is and then uh, I'll give more explanation of that. So if you look at you know, a region where we know around the gene, where uh, we know differential gene expression, um, can be predicted from a causal variant. And I'm showing the causal variant here by this um, purple triangle. Uh, what we typically observe is that um, the um, positions along the sequence that are used for making the prediction by the model, so that's apparent from the height of these letters, um, are typically um, um, regions that contain the causal variant are not kind of overlapping these motifs that the model has learned that's making to make predictions. 
Um, so they use kind of a sparse grammar that typically doesn't cover causal variants um, that predict differential gene expression. And we think the reason for that is that because the models are generally learning to predict differences in gene expression across genes. Um, so what makes some genes more higher expressed than others? And that logic doesn't necessarily translate to predicting differences of gene expression in one gene across individual that, in individuals that tend to be more subtle. Okay, so with that, um, in the last uh, few minutes, I'm gonna tell you very briefly of um, you know, how we try to solve this problem to actually have sequence-based models that can perform better in predicting differential gene expression across individuals. And this is uh, work that's driven by Shiming, um, Anna, and Alex in my group. Okay, so, um, so the fundamental, um, I guess, strategy that we're gonna use here is that we need more data because our hypothesis is that by training the model on like a single reference genome, you just don't have enough information to really understand when genetic variation in a given locus affects gene expression. Um, so we need data for uh, more genomes and in particular, more genomes pair with more functional outcomes, like cohort studies where we have whole genome sequencing paired with um, RNA-seq gene expression data. Um, so, and if we can train models like this, even if we have a couple of more genome, all of a sudden we can really increase the number of training data points because these models, um, as uh, if you remember, as I mentioned, the effective training uh, number of training data points is the number of genes or locus loci that we have. So um, if you train them on one reference genome, we have you know um, number of genes is the number of training data points. But if you increase that by even two genomes where we have um, two sets of measurements for, um, then that's um, we're increasing the sample size by a factor of two. So, um, but as it turns out that if you just you know, dump all the data, let's say um, I use the cohort study that I mentioned, so we have. Um, around 800 whole genome sequencing with RNA-seq data, if we dump it all in the same model and try to uh, make a more powerful model, it tends to fail. And the model doesn't actually learn anything interesting. And this is a joke that just says I mixed a bunch of data with a bunch of linear algebra, but in this case, it, it didn't work. Um, and uh, why doesn't it work? It turns out this is actually a really hard problem for two reasons. One is the scalability issue. So models like the model that I just explained in former, or the model that we've trained, AI tag, these are computationally um, very um, uh, costly to train, and even on a single reference genome. And when we want to expand them to multiple genomes, it just becomes um, really time prohibitive. And the second is that um, we actually need a different kind of loss function to get at uh, the signal that additional genomes uh, providing um, to uh, and what we want to learn from that, which I'll explain in a second. So on the scalability issue, the solution is not that creative. Basically, what we need is more GPUs and um, just need um, some parallel training algorithms that can achieve that. And here, just um, uh, for, for interest, I'm showing you the time required to train one of these like sequence-based models, like Informer, if you have one GPU, that would be four days. Um, but if you have you know 31 GPUs, that's one hour. So like, essentially we just need more GPUs and we can solve this problem. But the second problem, which is um, you need a different kind of loss function, is a little bit more creative. Um, and so the problem is that when, um, when we're training these sequence-based models, um, there's two things that we want the models to learn. Um, one is that we want them to be able to distinguish genes that are highly expressed from genes that are low, lowly expressed. And we can measure that by, you know, mean squared error um, uh, of like gene expression prediction. But the other thing that we care about is that for a given gene, we want, to, we want them to be able to predict differences in gene expression of that gene across individuals, which tend to be a lot more subtle than gene to gene variation. So we need to separate out those two kinds of uh, metrics that we care about, because if we don't separate them out, um, the model will ignore the more subtle variation across individuals and just learn about the larger variation across genes. So to do this, um, we created this model, Deep Allele, which is um, in preparation, preparation, this is ongoing work, um, that essentially tries to have this composite loss function um, that takes as input pairs of sequences for any given region. Um, and these pair are 
um, the reference sequence, which is like an average sequence for that region, um, and an alternative, which is an individual's um, sequence. And it predicts as output the reference gene expression, which is like the average gene expression, and the individual's full change. Um, and so because it does that, we can then separately measure how well the model is predicting just reference gene expression versus how, how well the model can distinguish um, between, um, um, or it can figure out when genetic variation actually results in differences in gene expression in an individual. Um, so have you trained a model um, like this? And I'm gonna very briefly tell you about um, three types of results. Um, but before getting there, um, I want to clarify one thing is like, when we train a sequence-based model like this, there is two layers or two levels of performance metrics we can quantify with um, increasing difficulty. So the easier thing that we can measure or, or it should be easier for the model to learn is for the genes where we have seen the re reference sequence, um, what we wanna figure out is that can they predict the effect of um, variation in unseen individuals? How well can they predict differential gene expression individuals where they haven't seen the variants in the individuals? Um, so that's kind of the easier bar. So they've seen, you know, the models have seen the gene, but they haven't seen some of the individuals. Um, and the, the harder bar, which um, no one has solved yet, is to be able to use these models to predict um, gene expression across individuals for genes that have not been seen by the model. So I'm not going to talk about the second one. I'll talk about the first one. So on the first one, we have some preliminary data um, that shows that this is our model deep allele. Um, each dot represents a correlation between predicted and observed across individuals. Um, this is kind of prediction that the baseline that we were using, and this is informer. So with this design that uh, we have with this architecture, um, the models tend to, our models tend to actually perform similar to PredictScan, um, but why is that good? Um, it's, it, it's good because PredictScan gets at this prediction in an entirely different way. It's a statistical method um, and it has no notion of um, what are the mechanisms that lead to prediction of different, differential gene expression versus this deep allele model because as a sequence-based model, it actually learns some mechanisms. Um, so I'm going to skip this. And the way we can show that it actually learns some mechanisms is that we can look at the, um, the actual known causal variants that we didn't tell the model that there were causal variants and look to see if the model can distinguish between causal and non-causal variants that are in LD um, with them. Um, and if we do this, so we can rank causal variants by their ISM value and compare that to the rank of non-causal variants. And what we see is that um, for the genes that the model predicts well, um, it tends to be able to identify the causal variants where kind of a statistical model wouldn't be able to do this. Um, okay, so that's um, all I was gonna tell you about today. So in summary, um, I guess one thing to keep in mind is that not all evaluations are the same. And this really came out for us when we we're looking at the informer model. So even though you can show that, um, you know, they, um, ISM can work when you use EQTL analysis, when you actually do a high resolution evaluation of the model, you realize that there is a lot of failure modes. Um, and the other note that I wanted to end on is um, kind of these current genomic models are really exciting because potentially they can be used to interpret personal genome, uh, but maybe there's some work to be done to make sure they can actually uh, work well um, um, across um, uh, different for differential gene expression predictions. Um, and this was done by um, students, Shiming, Anna, um, Alex. Um, the earlier part of the work was done by Gourmand and, and Bernard, um, and the collaboration um, from with Maria, Phil, uh, Phil Dieger, David Bennett, and Christoph Benemann.